Hello, oh, welcome everyone to another episode of Science, Plants, and Stellar Rhythms. My name is Eric Roth, shamanic astrologer, and I'm here to talk about the total lunar eclipse on May 26th. Here in the Pacific Coast, it'll be in the very early morning sky. Um, if you're you know, over the Pacific Ocean, it's going to be fully, uh, all parts of the eclipse are going to be fully available, including parts of uh, you know, Eastern Asia, Australia, New Zealand. But this eclipse uh, is, you know, happens in at a time when, you know, we're, we're experiencing more and more, uh, you know, we've definitely been in, living in intense times, or as, you know, some people say very interesting times. And uh, it just keeps, you know, things keeps, keep getting more interesting in the fallout of the alignments from 2020. And now we're upcoming here in the eclipse season. So let's proceed with uh, episode 19. Um, all right. So here is the here is the eclipse um, visibility. Um, so for those of you, this is from timeanddate.com. It's a, actually a really cool website that you can get a lot of uh, you know basic information about eclipses and calendars and, and that kind of thing. If you're into that, it 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 shows a lot of great information. So you can see here um, United States, North America. Uh, is in the window of it. For those living on the East Coast uh, or the central part, you don't get as you don't get to see as full as the as the, the people here along the West Coast. Uh, um, you know, people in southern Alaska and most of the Pacific Islands, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and the um, eastern part of of Asia into Japan uh, and Indonesia. You know, you you'll get to see. Uh, Quite a, a mo most of the uh, most of the eclipse, if not all, uh, certainly here in the center part of this. All right, um, there's a lot to share about what this uh, total lunar eclipse means, and you know, being the start of an eclipse season of uh, eclipses here, May 26, 2021, and on uh, an annual eclipse on June 10th, which I'll talk about in a separate video. Okay, so what is a total lunar eclipse? Well, uh, the Earth passes directly between uh, the moon and the sun. And the moon just happens to be going through a particular part of its orbit where it's connecting to one of its nodes, lunar nodes, which are connection points between the ecliptic and its orbital, orbital path along the, um, in the sky uh, around the earth. So this is, the, um, this is from Wikipedia. It shows you kind of the basic outline of how that eclipse is shown, how it, how it uh, shows up and how we see it. You can see the sun facing one side of the earth and um, which would be, uh, you know, the Atlantic Ocean and uh, much of Europe and uh, Asia. Um, and then uh, the shadow side of it uh, being the uh, Pacific side as what I, I shared earlier. At this time, when that eclipse takes place, it'll only be a few hours from the moon's closest point to the earth in its orbit. So that's called perigee. So that creates a super moon lunar eclipse. So I think it's certainly going to be felt uh, as far as astrologically and symbolically uh, fairly intensely. Uh, the, the total duration of the full total lunar eclipse is only 14 minutes. So it's fairly short. And I think that's in part due to uh, the moon's uh, closeness to the earth. So, um, and um, if it was a little farther away, it would be traveling uh, a little slower in that sense. You know, at least it would take longer to go through the shadow of the earth. But the total amount of time that it goes through the partial phases is almost three hours long. And the penumbral phases, which is kind of the, uh, the shadow of the shadow, uh, that's five hours long. So it really takes a long time for the moon to pass through the entirety of, of Earth's shadow and the sort of the, the shadow of the shadow uh, coming through that, that area. Um, and again, this is in the if you're on the west coast of America and Canada, um, you know, you could see the, uh, the total uh, lunar eclipse and um, it'll be happening like really, really super early in the morning. And um, on the opposite side of the planet, uh, in East Asia and, uh, you know, that part, you'll be seeing it in the uh, uh, mid to late evening skies of uh, that part of the world. 
uh, in the middle of the night, even, and, you know, if you're uh, closer into the, uh, the center of the eclipse. So, so this supermoon means there's, a, there's sort of a greater intensity um, uh, in this particular sign that it's in, which I'm going to talk about the astrological translations here, this from a shamanic astrology perspective and giving also a uh, perspective of Dan Mario too as well. So he, he just recently wrote something about this and I, I just happened to catch it. And uh, I'm gonna throw a little bit about that, especially around the natal chart of the United States. Okay, so here's my uh, sharing of this in uh, this full moon eclipse, total uh, lunar eclipse um, takes place at five degrees, 25 minutes in the sign of Sagittarius. Um, in the, it should be the, uh, yeah, a sign of Sagittarius in, it should be in the constellation of the scorpion, uh, only five degrees, not, uh, between the constellation. That's, that's, a an error there I've got there, but it's actually in the constellation of the scorpion, um, and, uh, five degrees from the, uh, from the star, uh, Antares. So, which is the heart of the scorpion. It's actually between uh, the claws in the head of the scorpion and the heart of the scorpion. So I think that's when I was writing that, I was thinking about one thing and, and writing another thing. So apologize for that, but it's basically in the scorpion. You'll, I'll show a night sky map of what it looks like when, when a person see out there actually visibly seeing the, uh, the lunar eclipse. Um, as I shared the map, it shows the, the different areas of, of where this will be seen. And um, it's an interesting thing because it's, it, it's a portal into the shadow of the earth. And it, but it's also an awakening and a closing of who we are and what we once were about. It's all the sunrises and sunsets are being projected upon uh, the, moon, the face of the moon. And that's why we get a you know, different, uh, like this different coloration tones up there from brown to red to orange, maybe even some, some little yellow in there, you know, uh, of different hues in that, in those uh, color bands. Uh, this is predicted to be a more darker level eclipse. It's not going to be as bright as, as past ones. Um, so I guess it, it'll depend on, on where you live and, and cloud cover and, you know, what, what, you know, particles might be in the sky to also might play a role in, in how that eclipse is seen. Um, this being in Sagittarius, it's, it's looking like it's, I, I kind of uh, uh, bring it into like a, a lighted torch into the entryway of knowledge, peering into the darkness with hope within the great unknown. So again, it's, it's offering up a lighted torch into the entryway of knowledge, peering into the darkness with hope within the great unknown. That's kind of a, a way that I intuited or perceive that kind of area of the sky and the way the eclipse is gonna show up as. So there's a lot of powerful imagery in that when it comes to, when it comes to shadow and to light and to knowledge and you know, what is known and what is unknown. So we have that kind of major combination and alchemy happening within this eclipse on the 26th of May. Okay, so this is something that uh, I only do sometimes. I bring in the US chart depending on what's going on. But uh, uh, Daniel Giamario, founder of the Shamanic Astrology uh, Paradigm, um, wrote something about this on, on shamanicastrology.com and I kind of put it in here uh, as I was looking for an additional layer to throw in there. And so this relationship to the U.S. chart really shows up in a, in a I think, in a special way because the eclipse is happening, um, uh, you know, not far from the uh, ascendant, descendant axis of the natal chart of the United States. So the United States has an ascendant of Sagittarius at 13 degrees and the Senate on Gemini. Um, and so we can see that the, the sun here will be in Gemini five degrees and the moon at five degrees uh, Sagittarius. So in his analysis, he talks about, um, this is, uh, it's always uh, signifies past and future destiny, a linkage between fate and original intent. So this first 2021 eclipse uh, season Saturn also continues, and he talks about this too. We can see Saturn 
continuing on past the natal position of the uh, south node uh, on the US chart in Aquarius. And this is the US is still in a cycle regarding its past, regarding its connection to its ori the original idea, the original revolution that took place, the constitution, uh, you know, uh, freedom from tyranny and uh, sort of the ideals that, that brought this forward, especially since it's in that sign of Aquarius. We can also see that the, U the US's moon, lunar position here, and also in Aquarius, that Jupiter is not far and actually will be making two more passes over the US moon um, later this year. So this is a, I think it really uh, brings to mind that Daniel brings to mind this really powerful imagery. And we can, we're already experiencing this in, um, in the US, the constitutional crisis we've had uh, with the transition, uh, the election in 2020 and the insurrection that was uh, prompted by Donald Trump uh, to take over Congress to try to uh, force his way in to become uh, reelected which didn't work, but it brought up an inquiry, a great deep and profound inquiry into what is democracy? What is a democratic republic? You know, what is our, why do we have this two-party system? And, and, you know, what, you know, this, 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 the ideals of what we want to dream into and all that goes with it, as far as also our, our history, our history on this land of North America, our history with Native Americans, with the slavery with everything that went into it and, and all the, uh, the issues that this has brought up and the things that we are now facing, which is I think a really powerfully good thing that we are facing these, we're having these questions, we're bringing them to the surface, we're dealing with them. And I think uh, we can't just let, you know, procrastinate this anymore. This is definitely needs to, in order for us to actually create a future, like I think the lunar eclipse is maybe showing us a little bit here uh, creating a future for ourselves. The June 10th eclipse also is going to be involved in this. Uh, it's only going to be six degrees from the natal position of the ascendant. I'm sorry, the descendant of the um, uh, of the U.S. chart, and only two degrees from the Mars position. So there's there is something really powerful about the uh, upcoming eclipse uh, in June 10th as well. It's an annular eclipse. Uh, so um, we could show, I mean, we could see this happening and this will be for a future video, of course, but uh, it's, this is just a reminder that we, we live in such intense times and wow, we're getting really a, a, a really powerful, um, uh, you know, connection here. And, and the, uh, I wouldn't say I wrote an article about this a year ago about uh, the George Floyd, um, uh, you know, death. And the, the police issue, um, race relations, um, and Saturn being in Aquarius, and uh, you know, looking at this US chart and seeing the natal position of the South Node here, you know, we can, uh, we're getting a full return of this because there was a connection to the early 1990s when Saturn was in Aquarius as well. And the Rodney King uh, incident that happened and the beating the violence that took place and the aftermath of the of the verdict of that uh, of the, the the police officers that were tried and then initially were kind of let go with a slap on the wrist, but then retried sometime after the riots and they did get uh, punished for that. But this is this is connecting in like this isn't something that goes away. This is something that is like we're hey this is systemic. There's something here we need to face and heal from. And in order for really to us to really embody our ideals here in a, in a country that we wanna um, you know, have is harmony for all peoples, uh, we can't ignore this. We've got to go with it. So this is uh, these, this eclipse season, the Saturn and Jupiter uh, transits uh, really bringing this up for us. Uh, and even I would say Uranus is also uh, playing a significant role in its um, squaring um, square relationship with Saturn. Okay, so where does this uh, lunar eclipse take place in the Scorpion constellation? And so we have this uh, right there by one of the claws of the Scorpion and near the heart. And this is, uh, the Scorpion is, the, is a guardian of the galactic center. And 
it's uh, the Guardian of the Galactic Center where the where great mystery, if you will, uh, you know, has a, a certain amount of uh, powerful symbology of where souls go to be, you know, uh, mythologically to go through uh, death and rebirth into a new life, perhaps in a new galaxy or another planet. Um, you know, this is a, a connection into uh, the way the celestial world meets the meets the underworld. And we can see this transitionary stage and um, uh, how these, uh, the scorpion, these stars can play a, a big role in uh, the, uh, you know, I say, uh, informing uh, the sign of Sagittarius as well as informing uh, the eclipse. And I was describing, you know, the, and the translation that I shared, uh, not translation, but the interpretation uh, that I shared earlier, not from Daniel, but from my, also my own, and how this lighted torch into the unknown, but with hope and uh, fear at the same time. Like there's some, there's a greater potential there. There's something there. It's like we're taking our medicine, and at the same time knowing that we have to, uh, we have to be initiated into, you know, into a new, a new stage, a new phase, a new chapter. And this is what I think, in part, this uh, total lunar eclipse is is about. Okay, so uh, another last thing I want to talk about with this lunar eclipse and all eclipses, really, I'll, I'll probably be bringing in for future videos as well. But this process called uh, a, a, a part of the rhythm and pattern of eclipses are called sorrows. And they're what we call, might call eclipse families. And they're intimately tied to the lunar nodes. So right now, the lunar nodes are in Sagittarius and Gemini. And later this year and into 2021, they start to transition, uh, 2022, I should say, they start to transition into uh, uh, Taurus and Scorpio. So that'll be uh, something to look forward to at a later time here. But the Saros family of eclipses, they take place every 18 years. And this is uh, Saros 121. The last time this took place was in uh, May 15th, 16th of 2003. And there's an author, there's like a grouping of the sorrows, uh, three 18 year periods, which go in, which are amount to 54 years. And that's when the eclipse comes back to the, to the same facing of the earth at the time of the eclipse. So this last time that took place uh, in 1967 at three degrees uh, Scorpio, but it was in you know, the same facing the earth uh, roughly around the same time where early morning time and the, on the Pacific coast of North America and, you know, covered the Pacific ocean. And, um, you know, because there's a little, a few days left over, you know, 10 to 12 days, each, each 18 year period, it kind of precesses a bit. So it goes back to April 24th, uh, 1967. So we can see that as part of the family. And that was really in a, a really powerful part of, um, uh, uh, you know, in the, around the world, with a um, Pluto uh, Uranus um, square, um, but it was also uh, Saturn and Chiron were, were uh, powerfully tied in also with Uranus and Pluto at the time in 1967. Um, I've done a number of readings of people that have uh, were born in 67, 66, 67, where they have that uh, really intense setup there. So where does Saros come from? It comes from an earlier Sh uh, Sumerian word called Sharu, uh, directly translated to the number 3600. And there's a, uh, a connection to the 60 uh, base numerals uh, that ancient Sumer had and um, eclipses and uh, rhythms and patterns and the word, uh, eventually the word sorrows that came out of, the, uh, of Greece um, from Sumer. Um, so there was a transcription of of, uh, by Edmund Hall, Halley, Haley, uh, and he recognized the Saros patterns uh, from, this is from uh, 1710. And um, these, you know, he listed them as eclipse families. And so this is something that in, from the ancient Mesopotamian writings, something that actually ended up becoming Saros. Like this is like the first sort of modern part of how that word came in about and the eclipse family started to really be noticed more in, in the modern um, astronomical fields um, in this kind of terminology. 
So this is something he, he published this in a, 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 the works called Caroline Tables in 1710. So that's something if you wanted to look up uh, some of the history about this. Um, again, this is, he got this from Barosis, a Babylonian priest from, uh, you know, uh, thousands of years ago, um, where he, where, where Edmund Halley got it from. So it can be, we go back ancient Sumerian, then we go to Barosis, and then we go to, uh, uh, who is also an, a, an astrologer, actually, astrologer, astronomer. And then we go to Edmund Halley that kind of brought this forward into this time. So these are, this is an, an entire um, family thing. There's a great book uh, that it was written um, uh, by Guy Outwell called The Understanding of Eclipses. And uh, it's got a lot of great information about uh, the sorrows and, and uh, a number of different eclipses and, and kind of getting into that. There's also a lot of uh, cool stuff in um, uh, uh, astronomical, ma mathematical astronomical uh, morsels uh, by Gene Muse. And there's four, there's four books available out there. And a lot of those books have uh, a lot of different interesting uh, statistics and, and things about eclipses and, uh, from almost every single like angle you can think of. And um, it, it, it was a lot of fun to read some of those. Okay, so that was this uh, upcoming uh, May 26 eclipse. I think it's gonna be really profound. Um, and again, this is in an eclipse season or really in a, when it comes to a lunar phase on a shamanic level, you know, the, the moon looks full for three days and it can, it can feel like it's a new moon for three days because the moon has essentially disappeared um, in the same kind of a way. So we, uh, so we can look at this energy of, you know, well, the moon will be in Scorpio, then move into Sagittarius for the eclipse. And then the following day still be in Sagittarius. So that, tra that, that uh, transition from Scorpio to Sagittarius and, and the Scorpion itself is going to be, I think, pretty powerful. Um, and, and so for those of you, I would encourage you, if you get a, a chance to go and connect with the, the lunar eclipse, please do so. It could be a meditative uh, um, exercise. And for those people that have um, uh, personal points on Gemini Sagittarius, this is, a, I think, a, um, you know, could be a really powerful, uh, you know, personal thing for you this eclipse season, as well as the eclipse season in November and December. So, um, you know, I want to thank you. Uh, thank you all for, for staying with me through this, uh, this video. And uh, please like and share, uh, subscribe. Uh, this really helps me uh, do more of these videos. So I, I'm really grateful for that because I love to share about the astrological and astronomical uh, information that's also tied into the mythology and the symbology. It's uh, a lot of fun, but it can also be, uh, you know, insightful. It can maybe be insightful for all of you out there. And my own research also connecting with some of these authors and their own research and getting me to, to have that information that teaches me as well. So uh, thank you all. And I hope everyone have a, have a, have a wonderful uh, eclipse season for yourself and to be out there and dream well. All right, thank you.